Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Smith, the Curriculum Coordinator for the BioNetwork Bioprocessing Center, and welcome to today's BioForum, entitled Code Green Super SIP, Integrating Sustainability into Technical Education. Our BioForum is scheduled to run from 10 a.m. to approximately 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Our panelist today is Holly Weir from Davidson County Community College. She is the Environmental Sector Project Director for the North Carolina Community College System Code Green Curriculum Improvement Project. The main goal of this project is to infuse sustainability into technical education programs across all 58 community colleges in North Carolina. In just a moment, I'll turn it over to Holly and we'll begin today's BioForum. We'd like you to feel free to ask questions by typing them in the chat box located on the right side of the screen. I'll be keeping a record of each question that is submitted and we'll have time at the end of the presentation to address all of your questions. Please mark your calendar for our next BioForum event, Safe Drinking Water from Source to Tap, Meeting the Challenge for Future Needs on August the 28th, 2012 from 10 a.m. until 11 a.m. Register for this event. Registration for this event is free and available online at ncbionetwork.org. We'd also like to remind our audience that if you log on to ncbionetwork.org forward slash IET, you can take advantage of our free interactive e-learning tools that we have created. These cover a wide variety of topics and we're certain you will find some of these that you can use. If you participate in social networking, we're also on Facebook. You may keep abreast of topics in the news, future events, and other interesting articles by liking us. Simply go to facebook.com slash bionetwork. Thank you, and we're excited to have you meeting with us. And at this time, I'll turn it over to our panelist, Holly Weir. Hi, everyone. Um, as Greg mentioned, my name's Holly Weir. I'm here at Davidson County Community College in uh, Lexington, North Carolina. Uh, we serve both Lexington, Can um, North Carolina, as well as Moxville, so Davidson and Davie County. So, um, I want to talk with you today about one of the projects that we've been working on, and we there's a collective group I'll mention in just a little bit um, who have been working on this project diligently for the past two years. Um, it was a very exciting project. I think um, it is very cutting edge. We've been looked at by many across the U.S. Um, about what we've done and how we've done it in hopes to implement it in places other than in just North Carolina. So we've served as a good model for that. So, um, And as you guys um, begin, if you're at different community colleges or if you're with industry, et cetera, um, this serves as a great model to help you create curricula based off of some of the new emerging technologies in our ever-changing economy. So I wanted to give you guys just kind of a brief introduction to um, who we are as the North Carolina Community College System. I've worked in the college system for eight years, and until I got onto this project, I didn't, I guess, realize um, the impact that we have in North Carolina. We are the third largest community college system in the United States behind New York and California. We have 58 community colleges that serve almost 850,000 students a year. And so giving that information, you can just understand the impact and the potential impact that we can have in North Carolina with just those numbers. I will say that the UNC system, the four-year university system, only serves 250,000 students a year. And as we all know, a lot of our students from the community college system um, go there. So. Um, uh, we have a much wider impact in the in North Carolina than we think. Um, we have multitude of different programs um, in the community college system, ranging from technical education programs to um, transfer programs. Uh, we do customized training programs as well. Uh, we work hard with continuing education, serving more than 900 courses um, in continuing education across all of our 58 community colleges. And uh, we also have things like workforce development and small business centers. Um, and, and all of these I want to highlight because one thing to mention is the second word in our name is community. And so um, this kind of helps set the stage for the uh, 
the impact that we have in our community doing a project like the one that we've done thus far that we we are a community we serve as a resource for our community we serve as examples for our community we serve as a large educational institution for our community and so with that holds a lot of power and a lot of responsibility um, and so given that information and, and understanding the impact and the potential impact that we have in North Carolina um, we uh, have implemented a code green initiative and so if some of you have read Thomas Friedman's book, Flat, Hot, and Crowded, he talks about the need for a green revolution, uh, one that looks at um, energy efficiency and environmental literacy and sustainable literacy for our community and so that we can reduce the impact we have on our world um, and make it more of a positive impact rather than a negative impact. And so um, this Code Green initiative was implemented in 2000 and between 2009 and 2010. And one of the things to highlight about this is that it is full support of our community college system president, Dr. Scott Rawls. Um, this is also supported by our state board of community colleges. And it's important because this board of community colleges has been empowered by the general statutes of North Carolina to adopt and implement policies and regulations, standards, et cetera, necessary for administrating and operating this community college system and so um, this project would not be um, would not be without the support of those two key figures and the last key support here is with our North Carolina um, Association of Community College Presidents all of our presidents at the 58 community colleges have voted for and approved this project um, and, and presented this project to our board of community colleges um, as well as the president, and solve this as an initiative. Now, what exactly is this Code Green initiative? Um, what I have here is kind of a flow chart of how this Code Green initiative um, works in our community college system. Uh, you can see here at the top that it's in full support of our system office president and our board of community colleges. Um, within our board of community college presidents, we have um, system-wide goals including environmental commitment, sustainable practices on our campuses, sustainable education and training, and helping encourage sustainability in our communities. Um, the um, creator of this kind of project, Dr. Rose Johnson, who is the current president and soon-to-be retiring president at Haywood Community College, and Dr. Rusty Stevens at Wilson Community College, um, saw this saw the the tremendous potential for us in North Carolina given the number of students that we impact and saw this as a as a, a great project for us in North Carolina to to take on the ownership of of infusing our communities and our students with environmental stewardship and energy efficiencies and so this code green project looked at four different areas um, again mentioned campus sustainability curriculum development sustainable communities and professional development and um, out of this um, curriculum development and education, uh, we saw that this Code Green Super SIP was um, coming through. And so what this looks at is four, uh, five different industry sectors. And so instead of looking at, a, say, a particular curriculum like nursing, we look at different industry sectors. And so this is kind of a collection of programs rather than just one program. Um, the collection of uh, industry sectors that we looked at were building and transportation, engineering technologies, environment, and energy. And so some of the, the overarching goals of this are to infuse those sustainable technologies into those areas. And so you're probably going um, curriculum improvement project. Okay, so if you're not working in the community college system, or even if you do work in the community college system, some of those things that happen at the system office really aren't quite known. Um, especially curriculum improvement projects. And so uh, basically what that is, it gives us an opportunity to look at the existing um, technical education programs in those industry sectors and to rejuvenate those existing um, programs, integrating energy and environmental efficiency skills into all aspects of those pathways. And so in the past in North Carolina, when we do a curriculum improvement project, um, basically it's just on one program, like I mentioned, say nursing or, or um, automotive. Uh, but instead, we're looking at industry sectors in this. Um, we actually ended up 
con- uh, looking at over 80 different curriculum programs in the North Carolina Community College system for this. And so that's where we, I guess, coined the term Super SIP. So it's a super curriculum improvement project. So our Code Green Super SIP, uh, one of the main goals here, again, is to empower our students with green job sector skills. And so as our um, economy, state's economy evolves, uh, we want to respond to those evolving changes. And in January 2010, the North Carolina Association of Community Colleges requested this curriculum improvement project to help rejuvenate those technical skills in those different pathways mentioned, building, energy, environment, transportation, and engineering technologies. Uh, we have um, initiated that in 2010 and for the past two years we've been working diligently with our faculty members from across the state um, at all of our community colleges. We have worked with over 200 faculty members um, on this project. It was fully supported by the system office, our community college system president, state board of community colleges, and the um, North Carolina Community College Presidents Association Um, But it was spearheaded and led by the faculty members in North Carolina. And so um, one other person to, um, so these are the college representatives that we have have, um, been sent to work on these projects. And I've noticed a few online with us today. Um, They can tell you that we met numerous times over the past two years. And um, a lot of the ideas and thoughts and processes associated with these curriculum changes were, were thought of by our faculty members, and so this was clearly a faculty-driven process. Uh, We have a leadership team who has overseen our progress and overseen our activities. Um, They also helped us. The goal of this was to help us implement this Code Green uh, Super SIP across the 58 colleges, as you can imagine, with 58 different community colleges. Um, and with, that's just like having 58 people in a room and asking them their opinion on something. And so, um, so they helped us implement this process across our, all of our 58 colleges. Um, the um, college presidents and North Carolina Community College System office staff were um, present on our leadership team. There were a select of them. And another thing to mention is that our industry representatives were also a part of this. Each of the sectors, building, energy, environment, transportation, and engineering technologies were, uh, had an advisory board of industry representatives associated with them. And so part of our job as technical education is to respond to job skill needs in our communities and to identify emerging job skill needs and integrate those into our technical education. And so what we've done is we um, sought out industry representatives to serve as a part of our leadership team as well as part of of our individual sectors. And the role of those advisory board members were to identify, help us identify, help our faculty as well as us identify the emerging skill sets specifically in sustainable technologies um, that were relevant to their fields of interest. Um, They also helped guide us in our curriculum development as well, and we thought that they were a very key stakeholder in this process. Since, you know, with technical education, our students hopefully go directly into the workforce. And so being led by these, we were able to, um, to formulate our curriculum standards. One thing to mention before we move on is that our different areas, we had a lead, um, the industry sectors that we mentioned here, building in energy, transportation, environment, and engineering technologies were each led by um, individual representatives from different community college. Uh, Rob Holson from Wilson Community College led our building sector. Uh, energy uh, sector was led by Andrew McMahon at Central Carolina Community College. Our transportation sector was led by Chris English at Blue Ridge Community College. And I led our environment sector, um, looking at programs dealing with cultivation of natural resources um, here at Davidson County Community College. And lastly, uh, Rosemary Seymour at Central Piedmont Community College led our engineering sector. Now, the, the five of us were overseen by a lead college, which is Wake Technical Community College. And uh, Butch Grove was our lead college director. 
And if you have any specific questions, I just wanted to mention their names, but if you have any specific questions about the um, individual programs associated within those industry sectors, that they are always willing to talk to you guys about the curriculum changes um, that were, were created as, as a result of this process. And um, if you need help getting in contact with them, I'm happy to, to help as well. So the industry sector areas, you can see from the map of North Carolina that we were widespread. Um, now, this process was chosen. We were chosen as sector directors because we wrote for um, an, an RFP, which is a request for proposal. And so we um, volunteered our time to um, manage this aspect of the individual um, projects. And um, you can see that we're widespread across North Carolina. I think that's really good for us as a group because that helped us evaluate the different changes across North Carolina. Um, and so that we weren't just um, isolated in one area, we were able to look at the different parts. You know, the things are different. For example, horticulture is very different at Blue Ridge than it is at Cape Fear Community College. And so uh, we were widespread, bringing in different aspects of sustainability from our different backgrounds. So our goals of this curriculum improvement project are, are listed briefly here. Um, they definitely get into a lot more um, detail uh, as we go through. I uh, just want to mention them for us. One thing that we want to do, again, something that I've mentioned, is providing streamlined um, program structure with more flexibility for our colleges. And so in order to minimize redundancies, we consolidated more than 80 curriculum standards into only 32 uh, curriculum standards. And so the reason we decided to do that was we allowed different program uh, majors, similar program majors, um, to be grouped together under a curriculum programs that share common academic and technical cores. And I'll show you examples of that in just a little bit. Um, the reason we like to do this is because of, of the emerging skill sets coming out in North Carolina. Um, for example, just because of the new and changing economy, and we've got things like solar panel installers being needed. We've got things like um, ground source heat pump. We've got different types of sustainable technologies. And so do we create a new technical program with those? Is that truly going to last? Is that the best thing that we can do as an educational system? Or do we need to embed those into some of our pre-existing programs? And if so, how do we do that? Um, and I'll talk about how we do that in just a little bit. Um, another thing that we've done is that we, um, we looked at revitalizing our um, applied science programs with specialized credentials in both continuing education and curriculum and creating that bridge in some areas between continuing education and curriculum. So, and we've all seen this at our community colleges where students take programs or take courses in continuing education and say, you know, I, I really enjoy this. I think I'd like to do this um, as a job. And, and can I get into um, a curriculum structure? Well, yes, that's fine, but you need to retake these courses because we didn't transfer those. And so um, we've established a platform in which we can allow, hopefully allow um, con and encourage um, continuing education to curriculum articulations. Um, and by doing all of this, our, we hope to increase the number of students skilled in our sustainable technologies. And so when I mention the word sustainable technologies, I don't want you to just think about solar and, and renewable energies and things like that. because. Almost all of our jobs in North Carolina now have some aspect of what we consider sustainability. And so looking at its environmental impact, its social justice, its economic impact, like almost all of our job skills have some component of sustainability. Um, something you may not think of would be um, our applied animal science, looking at the waste from our animals and, and what do we do with those wastes and how can we uh, mitigate those wastes in, in an environmentally friendly way. And so. Um, luckily, we had our faculty members and our advisory board to help us identify these different types and how we can infuse these into our, our um, technical education programs. Something else that we used to help us create our curriculum structure is the industry competency model from Career One Stop. And so this is um, by the Department of Labor and the Employment Training Administration, also known as the ETA. 
um, they developed this uh, competency model um, by working with business leaders, educators, and others. Um, this is a comprehensive competency model that documents the foundation and technical skills and competencies required for workplace success in our different industries. And so the one I've provided here for you is more of a general. And you'll notice at the bottom some of um, the most foundational skills associated with being successful in business and industry include personal effectiveness competencies like interpersonal skills, critical thinking, uh, I'm sorry, professionalism, uh, dependability. We've got academic competencies, some basic academic competencies, um, including critical thinking and communication. And then we get into some different aspects of work workplace competencies like teamwork and um, creative thinking and problem solving, decision making. And so as a team, we also decided that this was a great, found, uh, a, a great model for us to work with. And so when creating our curriculum standards, we use this looking at different skills and competencies that we could also incorporate into the program to help our students be successful in industry um, based off of these. And, and this is available at the careeronestop.org website. So if you'd like to look at this and, and um, to help you develop your curriculum as well, uh, you're welcome to get it from that website or me. And so over the two-year project, this um, began in 2010, and we are, as of tomorrow, finishing one of the last stages of getting this project fin uh, finalized and approved. Um, through the State Board of Community Colleges. For the past two years, we have worked on this project. Um, I have mentioned a lot about overall objectives of the project. I'll get into some of the specifics in just a little bit. But I just wanted to mention that um, we spent one year on our curriculum development component. Again, that's where we engaged our faculty. That's where we, we set forth a plan for ourselves. We got our faculty, our advisory board re uh, representatives involved in uh, numerous meetings to help um, find those similarities in our programs to group those together under um, programs that share a common and academic and technical core and um, develop those curriculum standards. Um, and one thing that we've done is we've also identified and developed student learning outcomes assessments to help our faculty members from across the 58 community colleges when teaching these courses help them identify some measurable outcomes students should have achieved um, at the end of their courses. Now, as you can imagine, as sustainable um, skill sets and new emerging, um, as the economy evolves and sustainable skill sets emerge, some of our faculty members might not feel as comfortable um, presenting and teaching to our students on some of these skill sets. And so a large component of our process was faculty, uh, professional development. And so we spent a lot of our second year working on professional development um, for our faculty members. And I'll go through the end and talk about some of the professional development opportunities that we offered um, to, our student, to our faculty members. And so a lot of these were geared in train the trainer type opportunities where our faculty member could become um, hopefully credentialed in those skill sets. Now, as I'd mentioned several times, we talked about curriculum development. So let's look at what that means for us and how we truly create a sustainable curriculum, one that will last through emerging. Um, and not only does it integrate green or environmentally skill sets into our curriculum programs, but also one that can last through our ever-changing economy. And so uh, in the past, we have always identified new curriculum programs and how we're different from something else. And so, for example, you can see that we have something like horticulture technology and management. All right, and so in the past we said, well, you know, we're, we're talking more about management, so this is going to be different than horticulture technology. And so what that does is given us a proliferation of curriculum programs in our community college system. So what we've done in this project, which is very different than some of the last, in my opinion, is we actually said, okay, well, now how are we similar, similar to one another? All right, and so again, we're looking at grouping these similar program majors together under one curriculum program. It gives our students, and the benefit of this is that it gives our students a foundation of general skills, allowing them more opportunity to branch into a specific program major in order to explore different career opportunities and job opportunities. All right, and so for example, if, if 
in this example that I give here with horticulture technology, if you take um, the academic and technical core associated with horticulture, all right, you've got multitude of different options uh, that you can go into depending upon your um, the job market that's out there and that your different interests in those fields. And so an example we give is the horticulture. This is out of my sector. And we looked at the different programs and, and grouped them together based on the fact that they all dealt with care and maintenance of landscape. And so uh, horticulture technology had turf, was grouped together with turf grass management, golf course management, and landscape gardening. Now, another thing that we did in this process was we eliminated any type of duplicative programs. And, and we didn't eliminate duplicative programs without the consent of the community colleges, so we weren't just kind of pulling it away from them without them knowing. Um, but we got in engaged into some conversations, and is this truly a unique program? And the example that you see here in red is the Horticulture Technology and Management Program. Uh, it was offered at one community college, and again, the difference was that it had two management courses, two business and management courses, um, and that was the only difference between that and the horticulture technology program. And so was this truly unique? Was this truly different? Um, and so through many conversations we had with a lot of people, we start to identify, well, no, it's better suited as a horticulture technology program rather than off by itself. So, so we grouped these individual um, curriculum programs together under one curriculum standard, horticulture technology. Now, we looked at their academic cores as well as their technical core. And what I'm going to show you here is a technical core. Again, this technical core um, gives our students the foundation and general skills associated with landscape uh, and, and ground maintenance. And so we identified in all of the programs across all of the community colleges that had landscape gardening, horticulture, and um, turf grass management, we identified that they all have a plant identification course, they all have a pesticide management course, they all have a design course and a soil science course. Okay, and so these served as a general technical core for all of those different programs. And so within our technical core, our students, regardless of, of what field they go into, have a very strong background in plant and um, land care maintenance looking at soils, uh, the design of their landscape, um, how to mitigate any type of pest damage, and how to identify and choose the plants that need to go into their specific areas. And so I think we can all agree, even though um, we may or may not be horticulturalist, that we can all agree that these do sound like the foundation of any of those individual different programs. Now, uh, we're talking about sustainability in the green component of it. You may be going, wait, there's a pest management course, all right, pesticide management. Um, so how is that sustainable or green? And so that was something else that we decided to look into. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. I just didn't want you to think we were going to forget it. So once they take this technical core, they'll take a course from here, one course from pest management, one course from a design, and one course from the soil science. Once they take those four courses, they're free to choose any type of program major associated with that curriculum standard. And so the program majors in this curriculum standard include golf course management, a horticultural science, landscape gardening, or turf grass management. And so what we see here is we have students taking their technical core courses, four of them, one from each section, and then going into their program majors. And so they have to choose one of our program majors, and then they'll take the courses um, so in this one it says um, take all of the ones listed and then anything else with a GCM prefix. And so those are the courses that they'll take. And uh, this gives the community colleges um, some prescriptiveness. Okay, and so we've got, what, about 12 hours here in our technical core. And listed in golf course management, we've got about 12 credit hours of our technical core. All right, and so if we are adding our 15 general education hours plus the 12 hours from our technical core, technical core, plus the 12 hours from our golf course management core, we've only prescripted 39 credit hours out of our minimum of 64. And so this gives our colleges a lot of flexibility and freedom to um, create those programs based upon their specific local needs. Um, the same is true for any of the other program majors associated with this, with this um, curriculum standard. 
Another thing that it gives um, our students is the flexibility. Let's say that they're at a college that has both horticultural science and golf course management. And a student gets into the horticultural science program major, they've taken their general education core, they've taken this technical core that we have listed here, and they've taken maybe a few courses from the horticultural science core, and they realize, you know, I just, I really don't like this. I think I'd rather go work on a golf course. Well, our student now doesn't have to start from scratch. They've already taken the technical core listed here, and now they just have to start with the golf course management core or maybe some other requirements associated with their college. But it doesn't ha a student doesn't have to start over again when they decide to change their program major, which is a benefit for our students because, as, as um, you may or may not know, our students um, – they come in and they come in because they need jobs. And so getting them out in the workforce sooner is, is better than uh, later, obviously. So um, another thing we've done, and so going back to sustainability and the green component of it is, okay, so how did we make these programs integrate sustainable concepts and sustainable skill sets? And so the one listed here is our course description from our horticulture pest management course, Hort 164. Now, if you remember a few slides ago that it was listed in the uh, technical core for this horticulture curriculum standard. All right, and so we can read here that it covers the identification and control of plant pests, including insects, disease, and weeds. All right, and so uh, reading this, it also says topics include pest identification, chemical regulation, safety, and pesticide application. Um, and so in, in the past, that's how we've taught our horticulture pest management course. Now, um, or at least how it's been required to be taught. A lot of as, as emerging skill sets come in and, um, you know, we're starting to understand some of the implications of using a lot of pesticides in our environment, our local environment, not just health reasons, but also environmental health reasons. Um, some people may not want pesticides and, and strong chemicals and, and um, synthetic chemicals sprayed on their plants. And so um, a lot of our college faculty have been teaching things like integrated pest management. Um, and so we have changed the course description um, slightly in the horticulture pest management course to include topics that we still you know, think it's imperative to identify pests, but also looking at the beneficial organisms associated with those uh, pests. Um, pesticide application safety, and use of the least toxic methods of management, all right? Um, and so do we, um, instead of just going in and blanketly spraying a, a synthetic chemical or even a, a, um, a natural chemical, are there other ways that we can critically think this situation and so that we can mitigate pest damage without having environmental implications? Um, one thing that we also wanted to do is, you know, we're not here to take away, you know, the use of pesticides or toxic chemicals because that's a, a, a valid skill set for our horticulture students to be employable in North Carolina. But we do want to give them those critical thinking skills so that they can look at a situation and evaluate what is our least toxic method. How can we manage this, this pest without doing a dramatic amount of damage to our environment and to the people that live in it and organisms that live in it. And so by doing this, we've changed. And so whoever teaches Horticulture 164 now will talk about beneficial organisms, how to mitigate pests using least toxic methods, um, et cetera. Now, I also wanted to mention that we don't, you know, this is fairly applicable to almost every single curriculum program that we looked at and almost every single course that we looked at. Um, we um, created, through the SIP, we as a group created 47 new courses and revised 219 courses in the community college system to integrate these student, um, to integrate these sustainable skill sets. And the example that I give here is through animal science. And so, you know, right offhand, you might not think animal science would be um, a topic that would be relevant to sustainability, um, but it was really inspiring because our animal science faculty were quite engaged in this process and quite excited to integrate um, some of these sustainable topics and skill sets into their course descriptions. And so they talked about sustainable livestock production. And so um, that is a, you know, a, a big component of, you know, things like greenhouse gases and environmental um, health. 
And um, I think another really inspiring thing that these, these faculty members decided upon was to look at the economic impact of livestock locally, regionally, statewide, and internationally. And so many times as employees in North Carolina, we, we really don't think outside of our city or our town or even sometimes our building that we work in. And so to provide our students with with the um, the idea that we should think about what impacts we have internationally, what you do in North Carolina, how does that impact us internationally, um, I think is a very empowering for our students and it helps them um, um, to realize that they are a large component of this world, not just one small. Um, another thing that we identified and created with our faculty and our advisory boards were student learning outcomes. And so again, these student learning outcomes um, were added to all of the technical education core courses that we mentioned in our curriculum programs. Um, they were scrutinized with current and emerging um, environmental and energy efficiency skills in mind. They were also, again, with the, created with the help of our faculty members and also with the help of our advisory boards. And you can see the ones that are listed here. They are designed to be measurable, so each, and they're not designed to be measured specifically, say through a physical test or, or a lab exam or something like that. They're left open to the individual community college and how they would like to measure that. Um, again, and these are the ones for the animal science course that I mentioned. Um, and you can see that we've kept sustainability in mind, um, sustainable production methodologies, um, and again, looking at how the environment plays a role in the animal's productivity levels. Um, and I don't know if many of you eat it at Whole Foods or get foods from Whole Foods, but um, they are a big component of that. So this gives our students entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, and now we didn't, another thing we used to create our uh, student learning outcomes is uh, our industry recognized credentials. And so the example I give here is from our energy sector and looking at the NAPSEP entry level exam. And so this looks at different levels of um, things associated with solar panels and how to get our students credentialed in the NAPSEP energy uh, certification. And so we looked at these individuals. I'll show you some of their learning objectives from their program. You can see this is in um, section one. So if we go back a slide, you'll see this talks about PV markets and application. And so we're just going to now go in and look at the specific um, learning outcomes associated with that. And so looking at these, um, we used uh, some of our learning objectives from this national credential and infused those into our student learning outcomes for some of our curriculum co uh, technical core classes. And so you can see that um, NAPSED Entry Learning Objective 1.2 is actually the first learning objective associated with ALT 220. And so we, when we could use our uh, industry-recognized credentials to help build and mold and create our um, student learning outcomes, we did that as well. Another reason this is a, an advantage for us is that when we create, um, when we have classes um, like Alternative Energy 220, the Photovoltaic Systems Technology class, um, having these student learning outcomes gives us the potential to create um, small components of continuing education courses for these. And so, for example, if we were to, to create a continuing education course that identified the first three uh, or maybe four student learning outcomes of this course, we could build a multiple um, multiple continuing education courses um, that have very similar, if not exact, student learning outcomes and then use those and bunch them together and use those to allow for um, potential um, continuing education to curriculum um, transferability. And so this gives our students a foot in the door when they decide, you know what, I really like photovoltaic systems, I like you know, sustainable technologies or even um, electrical work, I'd like to get into this. And so they've already taken one of their courses. It's not something that a student, when you tell them, well, I'm sorry, but that continuing education course didn't count. They feel um, like a door's been shut on them. So this gives them the opportunity to, to take another step into the doors of curriculum education. And another thing that I mentioned was professional development. We have a list of professional development activities that we have um, 
offered. We offered over 46 professional development events, and we served almost 700 faculty members in North Carolina by these individual events. Now you can see them listed here. Um, one thing that I'd like to highlight, we highlight is, is sustainability across the curriculum workshop I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but we looked at technical education and how can we affect technical education. Um, but I'd, I would feel like we would be missing the boat if we, if we just concentrate on technical education um, fully. And so I wanted to, and something that I did as a part of my group, is, is to bring in Dr. Peggy Barlett from Emory University. Um, she is nationally and internationally known for hosting Train the Trainer workshops for faculty leaders who wish to develop curriculum change programs. And so looking at sustainability and integrating them into almost any curriculum, whether it be continuing education, whether it be um, curriculum courses that transfer to four-year programs, or whether it be technical education courses. And talking about the skills required to integrate sustainability into those courses and curricula offered on our campuses. We offered this in March. Um, we were very fortunate to get her to come here. Um, she doesn't travel much, and she saw us as, as a pressing need, and she was uh, at, Actually, she just emailed me the other day asking for an update because, uh, again, we're doing innovative things in North Carolina with sustainability, and she's very interested to hear what we've done since her workshop. So, um, But there are uh, 23 different people from across North Carolina attended that workshop. Um, they work at your individual community colleges. And if you'd like information on, how, uh, on, on what we learned in this workshop, I am always happy to chat with you about it. Please feel free to call me or email me. Um, but this gives you some ideas on how to integrate sustainability um, in ways that we haven't done as a curriculum improvement project. Now, what are our next steps? Um, we have our um, curriculum standards. They were created. They were approved by the, um, overwhelmingly approved by our different community call, 58 community colleges, um, between a 91 and a 98 percent approval rate for the different industry sectors. We have um, presented our information to the curriculum review committee, who has overwhelmingly approved it unanimously. And our next step tomorrow, we are headed to Raleigh, the group of us, to speak with the State Board of Community Colleges and get their approval. Now, once approved by the State Board of Community Colleges, there will be a uh, implementation period, and information for that um, will be found on, on the website. I believe it's a two year, uh, one year implementation. So um, if they approve it tomorrow, then you can begin implementation and implementation is expected by 2013, fall 2013. Um, we also would like to continue working and, and um, encouraging sustainability on our community college campuses. And so I encourage you to attend the um, North Carolina um, Community College System Conference in Raleigh, um, October 7th through the 9th. We are creating a sustainability association, and we encourage people from uh, your business office, from your facilities, from your student life. We encourage your faculty members. We encourage all aspects of your college to attend and participate and be a, a member of this association. We've got some, some ideas on how to continue this, this movement of sustainability across our community college and continue to set ourselves out for uh, being an example across the U.S. Um, we're going to continue working on our goals of the Code Green Initiative. We worked really hard on curriculum development with that curriculum improvement project that we just got done working on, um, but we've got other areas to look at in campus sustainability, sustainable communities, and professional development for our faculty members. And so we're going to look at how we can continue this wave of sustainability here in North Carolina. Now, and one other thing that I'd like to mention is, is you know, I've said a few times how we just we really are um, ahead of of many other different community college systems across the nation. And um, two weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to be asked to attend the UNC System Conference. Um, and this is with you know UNC Charlotte, UNC Chapel Hill, um, as well as individual private community colleges. Um, they are starting something very similar to what we have done with our Code Green initiative, and we are at least three years um, 
we've got three years under our belt working in this process. So again, we are they're looking at um, not just two year colleges are looking at us for what we do, but also four year universities are looking at us for how we've worked in sustainability into our curriculum across North Carolina. Now I'll end um, by saying if you need any more information, please don't hesitate. I'm always available to call um, for a phone call. And as a matter of fact, my number is actually 4832, not 2832. Um, I don't know who 2832 is. <laughs> but uh, you're, you're welcome to call me anytime. Uh, you're welcome to email me as well. I am uh, happy to talk about how we can integrate sustainability into your college campuses and provide you with information associated with our project if you need more. So. With that, we'll go ahead and start questions. Okay, Holly, thank you. We have a few questions up on the board, and uh, feel free to go ahead and, and read the question and answer it if you can. Okay, so the first question is, I am a biotechnology instructor. Will Code Green directly, specifically impact um, biotechnology and bioprocessing curriculum programs? Yes, um, biotechnology was one of the programs that we um, in the environment sector looked at. Um, bioprocessing was not. Uh, if you'd like information about what we've done with biotechnology program, I, and, and I think out of all the programs that, for me, I am a biochemist um, by training, I, I think that that was one of the best programs that we created. We looked um, at combining um, agricultural biotechnology, environmental biotechnology we created. Uh, we looked at laboratory technology, and, and um, if I'm missing one, you guys, um, I know Randy's in the audience, um, Randy Duran from Piedmont. Um, who served on that um, steering committee. Uh, but we combine those curriculum technical programs into one. Um, but I'd be happy to provide you with that information um, if you just want to give me an email or a phone call. But and yes, biotechnology like, was involved. Yes, and it looks like Randy has replied for biotechnology. It makes for a smoother uh, curricula to administer for everyone. So good. Yeah, and it does. Like I had mentioned, it was one of the, I, I think, one of the smoothest curriculums that we created. And uh, everyone that looked at it, and we even worked with Matt Meyer, um, the new doctor, Matt Meyer, um, at our system office and uh, in creating that program, and he was very excited about its potential. Uh, how does, um, and Butch had most uh, listed there. We do have a link on our website. All of proposed curriculum standards can be viewed at this specific link associated with uh, the nccommunitycolleges.edu. So please, everyone, look in the chat box, and you are welcome to click on that link. And that is, I think, a 185-page document. So get some coffee, and um, you can scroll through that and read about the different um, specific programs and the specific courses that will be affected. Um, so how does the downturn in the economy affect green initiatives such as this, or does it? Um, I think that's a great question. I think that it actually can invigorate our green economy. Um, you know, one of the things that we, that I think as, as a society, I don't want to say we made a mistake, but we jumped on um, really quickly was looking at green jobs, green jobs, green jobs. Well, we just kind of really quickly went out and just kind of created different programs that we thought would address our green job situation. Um, but I don't think that we adequ adequately addressed that situation. And now we've done a lot of not only just self-education, but faculty education. Um, and I think what's going to drive green industry in North Carolina is educating ourselves, our faculty, our um, students, as well as our community about its impacts on um, not just the environment, but also social and economic impacts as well. And I think by doing that, we give our community, our students, ourselves, critical thinking skill sets uh, that we can use to then go in and look at a new situation. An example that I gave earlier was the horticulturalist. You know, 10 years ago, you said, hey, I've got a pest in my yard. Can you come spray it? Can you come fix it? They come in and they spray a chemical. They probably wouldn't even look at, a, at the pest. They just spray a chemical that they know works and goes on. Well, you know, now our community members are asking for us, you know, hey, listen, I've got kids, I've got pets. You know, I don't want you to just come in and spray a chemical. How can we mitigate this pest or even manage and control this pest image um, using environmentally and, environmentally and health-friendly practices? And so... Um, I think we're looking at things as a society is different uh, with new eyes, and I think what we've done was we've empowered our community, our faculty, and our students with those new eyes. 
Uh, and then the last question is, where can I get a list of the courses reworked? And that is listed there in the link associated with that. Thank you, Butch, for coming up with that. And, and, and I did want to mention, I think I saw on the line today, Butch Grove is our SIP director, at lead director at Wake Tech. Um, he's online with us today. And uh, Rob Holston is online with us as well at Wilson Community College. He led the, the, uh, the building sector. And I want to thank you guys for your interest in this project. It has been something that I will say has been near and dear to our hearts, us being the sector directors and the faculty members that worked on it for the last two years. I mean, we've just been passionate about what we've done. We've been excited about what we've done. And we really feel that this is going to make a, a huge positive impact in our students and in our community. And uh, we look forward to continuing working in sustainability. I hope that if you work at a community college that you will tell your friends, your neighbors, your peers about our, our potential green um, uh, sustainable um, association associated with the community college system and can join it. Uh, again, we're looking for people from everywhere from business to facilities to your student life, et cetera. We need all, all participation to fully impact our communities. Great. Thank you very much, Holly. We really appreciate it, and I personally learned an awful lot today. Please mark your calendar for our next Bioforum, Safe Drinking Water from Source to Tap, Meeting the Challenge for Future Needs, that it will be presented on August the 28th, 2012 at 10 a.m. Registration for this event is free and it is currently available online at ncbionetwork.org. I'd like to thank our panelist, Holly Weir, once again for today's presentation, and thanks to you for your time and participation. This concludes our webinar. On behalf of all of us at the North Carolina Bio Network, thank you and have a great day.